Okay, so let's let's talk about it at least. So with uh, let's talk about what we were seeing in the trauma. So uh, we were going to do this working session with them uh, as. Oh, sorry, we were going to do this working session with them. Uh, it's pretty much an ad hoc session, but we did actually spend a half hour last week looking at it ahead of time just to get an idea of the kinds of things we were we were going to be uh, maybe recommending. And I'll give you some examples of what those are. So, uh, and certainly I can show, uh, maybe I can show some things in my admin here as well. So let me share my screen and we'll go that direction with this. Uh, but uh, I prepared for a lot of things, but not for Wyoming being offline. Let me share. It does look like there's some volunteers in the chat. Oh, there are? Okay. Jay Whitver, would you mind? Uh, all we really need to do is uh, share a screen with your file wave admin, and then I'm going to ask you some questions, and we're going to treat this like we would treat uh, professional services discovery for looking at these type of topics. And I don't think it seems that share is turned off. So whoever the host is, okay, now I'm the host. All right. Go ahead and share your FileWave admin and hopefully for kind of a long-term uh, customer that's got a lot of history in there would be good. Can somebody share? Or, I'm not sure if you can share if you attempt to. Yeah, um, let's see. Oh, okay, one second. Uh, there, you should be able to. Missing it. Let's see. Okay, cool. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right. So this is when I say this is ad hoc, this is really ad hoc, but we're going to talk about uh, organization. So if who are we talking to? Maybe you want to introduce yourself and what environment you're from? Sure. This is Joshua. Oh, hang on. We, had, we, are, we had this up on the projector, and so I'm getting some dueling audio right now. So they're going to turn that down a little bit. Can you hear me better now? Yeah, I can hear you great, Josh. Okay, great. Yeah, I'm Josh Woodver from Urbandale Schools in Iowa. Uh, we're a district of about 4,000 students and looks like at the moment about 1,200 computers um, plus about 4,000 Chromebooks. But All right, they're, excellent. They're not, they're not in, in file. So. All right, excellent. Well, well, let me ask you some questions. All right, can you take us to your client's view? And you're managing, uh, you said, uh, you're doing iOS and Mac OS, it looks like? We have Macs, PCs, and, IO and iOS devices. In Excellent. Here. So that's at a really good... Had, at one point, we had Android, too, but we ditched those. So. Okay. All right. Excellent. That's a really good mix of things. And how long have you been running FileWave? 2004. Okay. So you've been running it for quite some time, right? That's plenty of time to have accumulated some mess. And I don't know, have you done any kind of reorganization or anything recently? Um, I mean, we, we keep tacking stuff on. I don't know that we've done any kind of mass organization. The scheme that we came up with at the time seems to have worked reasonably well for us. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about this. So what I'm seeing is it looks like you're using a lot of static groups. So are the codes in there like MW and OLM, are those school codes or? Yeah. So like Jensen Elementary and then Karen Acres and all that kind of stuff. And so then okay. we, use, we have a lot of... Uh, Clones, I guess you call them, so like are all Macs and basically just clones of all mm -hmm. the buildings. Um, like all the okay. are just clones of all the carts and labs within the buildings, that kind of thing. Okay, and this is a very typical, uh, very typical structure for a lot of folks that have used FileWave for a long time. Uh, was back in the day, right before, I guess it was 2017, I think it was, uh, when uh, custom fields came along. This was very, very much the norm. 
uh, because there wasn't any other way to really organize. So folks would do exactly the structure you've got. So if we take a look at that RG group there for a moment, uh, that is a breakout. Then what's, what's RG stand for in this case? Rolling Green, it's one of our elementary schools. Okay, so it's one of the schools and then you've got within there, you've got faculty, uh, you've got uh, with, uh, then you've got a separation between laptops and desktops. And all of this stuff is, is uh, you know, very, very typical. And it looks like you've got original devices that you're putting in there mostly with some clones. Yep. Okay, so uh, this is very typical that we see in a lot of environments and there are advantages to it and it works. Uh, and a lot of people stick with this, but I'm going to give you kind of an alternative that you can look at. It's at least something to consider, and I'll tell you uh, why it does have some advantages. But first, can you tell me about how you manage from a personnel standpoint? Uh, who, who's managing FileWave? Is it just the core team? Do your field technicians, do your school technicians have any access to FileWave? Do they do anything in there? We're a relatively small department, um, so it's primarily myself, the assistant manager, um, our techs get in there some, but not a lot. It's mostly the two of us. Okay. So what happens when a teacher goes from, say, Gen to KA? Um, we'll generally just move the device and rename it. So I'll slide this over here. And... Right, exactly. But you have to do that, right? Because right. The, the field technicians that are probably the ones that know that that person's leaving. Do they put in a request for that to tell to well, let you know that a change needs to be made or how does that work? Yeah, so I mean, we don't have much in the way of field technicians. So we have, our department is myself, my assistant manager, and we have a technology specialist and then two full-time techs and that's, that's us. Okay, and does everybody participate? You mean in FileWave? In, in FileWave, file yeah. To some degree, yeah. Okay, well, the, the reason I asked that question is because one of the things that happens a lot uh, especially in some of the bigger districts where there's a, you know, a technician per school and 50,000 devices and all that kind of thing is that folks get scared about giving away the ability to update the model uh, because they don't want just anybody to be able to do that. Uh, and with the structure that you've got right now, you kind of force yourself into a position where you don't give some people the ability to move devices because you don't want them to make a mistake, right, with moving the device from here to there. Uh, so one of the things that sometimes is helpful is all of those breakouts that you're doing. Like if you, can you go back to RG again real quick and, and, and open that up again? So you're doing that breakout by, uh, uh, there's a difference between faculty and students there, obviously. What are the, C what's CC and MC? Um, so this was back when we oh, actually, had, Mac, yeah, back when we actually yeah. had Mac labs. So this would have been the card catalog station, then the media center lab computers. Okay. You don't have and that. And in this case with this school, it doesn't look like there's a one-to-one -one or anything. It's just all the devices are in lab or classroom. Yeah, up to basically COVID, we were not one-to-one -one in any fashion at all. Um, COVID kind of kicked us into one-to-one -one for our Chromebooks, but we have, other than that, have not been one-to-one. -one. Okay, all right, so that's a perfect example. So if you look at these two things, you basically got student devices and faculty devices. Yeah, high school might be a better place to look at those because we actually have Okay, devices. so yeah. All right, and you've got carts as well. Right. So all of this structure uh, requires that you put things in certain places. But uh, if let me uh, let me ask you a question. Right. If somebody came to you and said, how many carts do we have across the district? How many devices do we have in carts? Mm -hmm. Well, how would you do that? Uh, that I'd hop, up, hop over to our asset database and just do a quick search on basically devices with cart in their name. Yeah, and that, okay, and that's Does that matter. I can just search for cart, and that would tell me, you know, best part. Okay, so you do it, so you do it in a naming scheme then with yeah. your devices as well. Okay, so let me show you. I'm just gonna we're gonna do a couple of things. We're not gonna make any changes to to live anything. I'm just gonna show you some alternatives for a couple of things, and and you may not care. And this is for everybody that's listening, of course, because Josh and I are having this conversation while everybody listens in, right? Uh, but it's this is pertinent in in lots of organizations. Uh, the ability to give access for other people to help you out in many, many, many districts. What I see is two or three people that are the file wave admins and there's 50 technicians 
And all the requests when a technician says, oh, I need to move a device from this school to that school and they don't have model update is that all the work that these people that are field technicians that should be working for you instead of the ones that are giving you the work to do. So uh, this is kind of a topic of enablement of allowing other people to do stuff, but it's also uh, enhances reporting and makes it a little bit easier to report on things. So if we considered those carts for a second again, Let's just go into, if you go into your assistance menu, uh, hopefully we'll see that. I don't know if you're sharing the whole screen or just the application. So let's see what you get when you share or go into uh, the custom fields assistant down there at the bottom. Uh, and then do edit custom fields. Okay, let me share my whole screen here. Okay. Not, yeah, you're not able to see that. Make sure. Close that chat window where you're saying Tony's an idiot. I can't believe you're listening to me. Well, at least close off the message that I have with my CFO. Okay. <laughs> okay. So we can see you just fine now. Uh, right. Super. So you're using custom fields a little bit, right? For a few things. For a couple things, yeah. Right. So you're reading, it looks like those are mostly script based, right? Where you've done a, a few things script based, and then you've got your asset tag, which almost every every single environment does, right? So let's assume for a second though, that we wanted to get some of the breakouts of the things. So these are examples of things that I see in your environment that we're doing. We're doing a school code, we're doing a uh, student versus faculty or you know, lab device versus, or classroom device versus, versus uh, staff device. Uh, and you've also got, uh, what was the other thing we just talked about? Uh, I don't remember, uh, but let's start with the school codes. Right. So if down here at the bottom, if you click the plus and let's add a new custom field. And again, we're not making any changes to production. So for those of you who are considering doing any of the stuff that I suggest here today, one, don't rush into doing it. This is not an overnight change to doing anything. It's, but two, just adding a custom field and defining some things and playing with it with smart groups doesn't change anything about the way you're doing any of your other stuff. So you can do it kind of freely uh, without it impacting anything. And you can move to this structure very slowly if it works for you. This is not necessarily a better way to do it. It's just another way to do it that does have some advantages too. So let's give it a name. In this case, let's just call it uh, school code or well, however you refer to things. I guess you do have a building there, but I don't know if you use it in the same way. All right, so school code, right? And then we're gonna say that it's provided by the administrator, which just means it's a field that's in the file wave admin, not one that's script based. And we're gonna assign that to all devices, which is really just a way of, it doesn't change anything. It just tells the, the every record will get this field, okay? And then the data type, it's gonna be a string, but we're gonna check that checkbox to say restrict allowed values. Because what we don't want is people to type in the school code and then fat finger it and spell it wrong or they, uh, or they you know, sometimes don't capitalize it or any of those things. So, uh, pardon my uh, four-legged coworker here. Uh, so we're gonna add with that little plus down there at the bottom, some school codes. And we don't need to do them all, but we can do a few, right? So if you wanna put it three or four, uh, you can just, what, RG and OLM and MW and all those. Okay. And then add one more and just call it none. All right, and you see that that uh, how Gen there is is set. Yeah, you knew where I was going. Gen is set to the default it was before. That's why it was bolded. Uh, now, Josh, you you're ahead of me. Why did you switch none to be the default? Uh, I imagine because we don't want to assume things until we actually explicitly set it. And that's true most of the time. So in this case, with the school code, we definitely don't want to explicitly set it to Gen for everything by default because the devices would all go into a gen smart group that we're gonna create here in a minute. We don't want that. So in this case, we want none to be the default uh, because we want to set it after the device enrolls. But in another situation, like if we're thinking of something like restriction profiles, in fact, let's go ahead and create another one uh, right now, Josh over there on the left, if you could do another new code for us, uh, something like user role or something like that. Like a restriction is fine whatever you want to call it. And again, we'll do administrator. And again, we'll say assign to all devices, right? And this time string, and again, restrict the allowed values. But let's talk about the things you do, and this may not be pertinent in your organization, but what do you do for restrictions? Do you have like a student set of restrictions? Um, yeah, we have 
a few different kind of scenarios where we would deploy a different combinations or profiles. Yeah, and so in a lot of places, there's like a normal student one, there's like a normal staff one. Sometimes there's a lockdown student one where there's like a student got in trouble and all of a sudden you wanna lock them down so they can't do you know the browser at all or something, right? Anything like that. But let's just put in a few things here, whatever uh, you can go ahead and add. Uh, certainly student and staff and, and we can do whatever else. Right? Are those the two? Is there like a lockdown student or a, yeah, <laughs> something like that, right? Okay, and in this case, right, you notice one, we didn't, I didn't suggest anything about adding a none, uh, and student is the default. And in this case, that works. Student actually is good for us. Why? Probably because they're the most locked down. Well, yeah, they're not the naughty children, right? Which is a, kind of the exception. But we definitely don't want to give people staff by default. And we definitely don't want to give them no restrictions by default. So the safest route is just to go, hey, every new device that we enroll uh, is going to be student restrictions unless we say that it's staff or a naughty child. Right? So sometimes we want to set a default that doesn't mean anything like none. Other times we want to do things like set it for a student. All right, so let's go ahead and click uh, save there. Okay, and we probably, the time is flying by. We could probably do this for three hours, but uh, at least you get a taste for this kind of thing. And, and by the way, we do this all the time. So if you've got any PS hours or training hours left over that you never used, please do reach out to us when you do exactly this kind of exercise in your environments. So let's just go real quick, Josh, and, and ourselves now. So it, down here at the bottom, just create a new uh, static group that's like, you know, play area or test area or something uh, that we can create so we know that this is all stuff that we can just throw away when we're done. Okay. And in there, right, we can create uh, some kind of new static group called like school structure or something like that. Don, like to make a gen group in here? Is that what you mean? Well, we'll do that in a second, but I'm just talking about generically that this would be a place where we put the school smart groups. Okay. okay. So in here, we're going to do new smart group. And this is where a duplicate smart group thing that we added in 14 really, really does make things simpler. Uh, down at the bottom, go ahead and click the plus and we're going to add, oh, you give it a name too, but of course. Uh, but uh, we're going to go with an inventory query. And over on the right, you're going to click the little ellipse and we're going to go through and pick our uh, from the custom field section, or you can just search for it, either, either one. Uh, I think we did, uh, well, uh, it's not, not that one. Do we want to take, oh yeah, that's the right one, school codes. How'd you get that just by that dragging in? That's strange. I don't know how that worked from what you have filtered on the left, but never mind. We'll go on it because it worked right. <laughs> okay. Uh, and you go ahead and give it a name because it, uh, and it has to have some kind of name. The, the name of the inventory query doesn't matter too much, but the name of the smart group does. So here, go ahead then and name this one as, as Jen. I think it was you did, right? Yeah. Okay. And doing okay. And of course, what are we going to have in this smart group? Not a thing. Right, because, oh, you already have one called Jen, so it just threw the one on there, which is cool. Uh, so we don't have anything in there, why not? Because nothing has that field set yet. That's right, okay. But now, you're doing it here with this individual device, but we can actually do it much higher. If you back up to the Gen level, the very top level, mm -hmm. and you right click there, and say edit custom field values, and you're gonna see that some things say mixed multiple values means where they're different, right? But we can just go to the school code one and notice that the, it says none because that was the default that we set. But you can just click on that and from the drop down, then pick gen and all of those are now set. You have to click off of it and then click, yeah. And now gen one, as soon as it evaluates smart groups next time is, and that doesn't happen all the time, by the way, it's only every 10 minutes by default. You can force it to happen if you right click on it. That's what that refresh group option is about. All right, that's gonna populate. Now you can right click that and choose duplicate, right? So now you've got all your gen devices in one place 
and now you can duplicate that and you can do the same thing then for the other school codes and we won't go through all of them but you can do one more if you like and all you have to do is change the thing that you set it to and then the name of course Okay. Now the same thing goes for the student staff thing that we just did. When it comes to assigning restrictions, you may forego all of the school stuff. Maybe the schools aren't a part of it. It may be when you're assigning your profiles, your restriction profiles, are you assigning it to all the groups? No, I think that's where you were saying you were doing your cloning, right? Of all the groups into that location. So you could do that. Right. So like our associations yeah. are primarily to, you know, like either all max or, you know, the individual stuff here. Right. Yeah. So, and you kind of, you end up forcing yourself to have to do multiple associations and such because of the breakout of the groups. Mm -hmm. Whereas doing it with a custom field allows you then just to create one smart group, right? Or one collection of smart groups, at least where you've got one for staff, one for students and one for naughty children in our case, <laughs> right? And then you can just assign the profile to that group, that smart group. And it doesn't matter what school the device is in. And the, the, the nice thing about it is if we just pick one device and we'll have to, we'll have to break because we're right at the end here. If you pick one of those devices that you've got there, right click mm -hmm. it and go into uh, edit custom fields. This change, if we assume like we've already built out our student group and our staff group here, if you change that user role from student to staff, this change if the content, the restriction profile that you got that goes to the device is based on a smart group, once you make this change, you do not have to update the model after doing so. That happens dynamically and the device will pick it up automatically. What that means is that your field technicians, if you build it in the way that we were kind of looking at here with the smart groups rather than the static groups, is folks that have lesser rights, like you said, even some on your central team don't have everything. Uh, you can give them or allow them to change those custom fields, but not update the model. And what it means is they can't do as much damage, but they can facilitate doing some of their own stuff. You can think of it kind of like the way the kiosk is displayed uh, to users in the field, right? You don't just allow them to randomly do anything, but you're giving them within bounds, hey, you can do this, mm -hmm. right? Which means that in your scenario with these two custom fields, you could allow uh, somebody with lesser rights to actually move a device between schools uh, to say that it's a student or staff device and then drive whatever the content changes are for that. So in your case, like if we went back to your original gen group where you're looking at faculty here, you got desktops versus laptops and you're doing that designation as well. All of those things could be driven by the dynamic elements and they're the same logical decisions, right? The same things that you're already doing, right? You already know oh, this is a laptop. So it goes in the laptop group. You do the same thing with a custom field. It's a laptop. Right. Or maybe even you can read model information and drive it dynamically that way. Mm -hmm. Right. But so it's not necessarily better, just a different way uh, to look at things. Yeah. And like this, this distinction really probably doesn't even matter so much anymore. It's really historical back in the days of 2005 when there are real differences in how laptops and desktops were used. Yeah. Yeah. And that too. Right. And so this is a, that's sometimes at break time, it's a good time to evaluate coming back to these things and saying, well, you know, and, and granted, I'm all for the, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, school, right? So if this is working for you, I never say, hey, let's do it a different way. But if you've got an issue or it's not very feeling very efficient for you, that's the time when it really makes sense to say, well, do we do it that way, but is that the way that we really want to do it, right? And maybe it's worth the investment of time, just like in woodworking, does it, I make that same cut a hundred times. Maybe it makes some sense for me to make a jig that makes it easier for me to make that cut. And right. I'm going to end up saving time uh, in big, the long run. So yeah. my, my big thought about changing things is here's just all these associations that then could potentially need to get redone to point to the new smart groups instead of the static groups that just, I don't know what kind of migration we'd be looking at for that. But. Yeah. Well, and, and just, you know, as our last kind of parting shot, if you go back to that associations window again, uh, when I see that, what I see here is a lot of direct associations too, mm -hmm. to individual devices. Yeah, and they right? have it becomes very messy and hard to police, 
right? So, you know, it's just hard to keep it uh, straight. One mm. thing I do recommend highly to cheat a little bit if you want to see like what things you could clean up a little bit because you mm. sometimes you probably get surprised by stuff that's installing and you're like, wait, how did it get that? Right. <laughs> or why is that still installed? You can actually take this data and export this and bring it into Excel and then do all sorts of stuff to filter and sort and say, oh, I should get rid of this and that, and, right? Because it's, it's a lot to look at in this view, even though you can filter in there. It's not quite as good as you can filter in, say, in Excel or something. Yeah. Is it possible to see on the, on the file sets which file sets don't have any associations at all? Because I'm sure that there's stuff in here that could really easily be deleted just because it's not. Well, a that's a great question. There's a feature request to ask about that. You can tell it in the web admin Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you can't really report on it yet. So I don't know if you've been in your web, what version are you on, Josh? We're on 14.1.2. Okay. So if you hop in your web admin for just a second, which you may or may not have used much, uh, but this is a really useful function of it. Uh, if you go into that. It's well. And I prom I know we're supposed to be breaking for the for the end of this, but we'll just give it another minute or two. Don't feel any pressure, anybody. If you need to go, feel free. Oops. Ah, sorry. Oh, maybe I can't get into it. Is it FW admin? Are you logging in as yourself or? Not that really. There you go. Okay, perfect. If you go to the payloads view, Payloads is the terminology in the in the web admin. This is the, the terminology we're moving to. These are the th elements, the, the faucets that you have. Right. So you can filter in here the same as you can in native, but if you go and pick one of them and just click on it, in the detail view for that uh, particular faucet or payload, you're gonna see that devices tab, uh, and it's gonna show you specifically what it's assigned to, right? So in this case, a lot of devices, right? But if you go to one that doesn't have any, you're gonna see that too. Mm -hmm. So do you have one that's suspect that you may know of that doesn't have any? Oh, I'm guessing probably our 10.2 apps or 10.12 apps are probably not being heavily used right now. Yeah, and you see it said zero, oh. so. Actually, I'm surprised. We need to get rid yeah. of those. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Right, so there's several things that you can do from there. So you can see that from the payload side. And if you look for, well, just while we're in the web admin, one real quick thing as well. If you go to the device view for one of those devices, just any random device, it doesn't really matter. All right, and if you click on the detail view here, when you look at payloads, you'll see in here how it's associated. So that associations column, that's super helpful uh, because especially if you've got the next column over, it shows you how this device is getting that payload from what group or what association. Nice. Right, so those that show NA, I suspect those might be direct, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, or might, you know, who knows, might be a bug. Yeah. Uh, but I don't think so. I think it just means that it's uh, it's direct. Uh, but you see a lot of those are all Macs. So you can look at it from both directions. You can look at it from the payload direction or you can look at it from the client. And although client info in the native admin shows you yeah, it's what associated. is associated, it doesn't show you how. It's like this burn.app one, for example, is NA. Um, oh, it's a, that's a kiosk app, so that's probably why. Um, that's look at Cocoa Dialog. So that's getting that probably through the all max one, which is this guy here. So it's just a bunch of aliases or clones would be how that one. Yeah, that one's, so that would be something to look at. I'll, I'll take a look and see if I can replicate that. This is the first time I've seen that issue. But uh, hey, Josh, I just want to say thank you for, for stepping in and helping us out here uh, after we had kind of the aborted thing. And hopefully for those who have attended this session, uh, this has been kind of worthwhile just to go through the environment. And please, if you've got some training time or you've got some PS time uh, remaining, please do reach out to us. We'd be happy to sit down with you and go through this kind of exercise. And, and again, just because we say it doesn't make it right. 
Uh, but uh, we have a, some, you know, we're, we have the luxury of working with lots of companies that use FileWave in lots of different ways. So we can kind of pick and choose all the best from all the best places and say, hey, this is how, you know, somebody else is doing it. And then you can pick and choose what works for you. All right. All right. So thanks, everybody. We really appreciate it. And I think we are back. Uh, is it the top? It's in 15 minutes or five minutes, something like that. Yeah, just a few minutes. So we'll be back and we're gonna hop into a couple of training sessions. So thanks so much and we'll be back shortly.